This video is about everything I wish I knew about renting a van in Iceland, but before I got there. This video won't be a beautiful travel log. It's more or less a class for you on what you need to know to rent a van in Iceland. We're going to go over picking out a van, stuff to bring with you, insurance, airport arrival, duty-free store, picking up your van, groceries and liquor. I'll also go over highway conditions, what the campgrounds were like, how much they cost, what our van was like, and what it's like to sleep and live in a van, buying fuel, what it costs, cooking in the van, eating out, some of our activities, internet and phone options, as well as uh, drone regulations. First out is picking out a van. Um, there's lots of different companies in Iceland. Most of them are very good. Uh, we just happened to pick uh, Go Campers because they had the availability um, at kind of a late date. Ultimately, the choice will depend on how much you want to spend, what kind of deal you get. And one of the major decisions is if you want to drive on the F roads or not. The F roads are the four-wheel drive roads between the major paved roads. And if you decide to do that, you'll have to have a F road certified van, which is four-wheel drive, high clearance, and good tires. And those cost substantially more. We decided to opt for the regular van because there was plenty of things for us to see on the regular roads and we wouldn't, didn't have time to really do the F-roads anyway. So what do they cost? Um, I'll walk you through their website. It looks like you could get a van for 59 euros a day. I, I guess maybe you could, but I'll explain that. The one we picked um, says it's 119 euros a day. Cheaper two-person camper basically has a permanent bed inside with an area for storage for your camping gear. Um, they do provide like a portable stove, some dishes, silverware, that kind of thing. But you're going to do most of your cooking and living outside the van except for when you're sleeping. It rains a lot in Iceland and there's also some pretty uh, rough weather. So we decided to go with the three-person van where it has a table that can be set up during the daytime where you can eat and cook and then you turn the table into a bed and sleep in the nighttime. We actually got inside the van and hung out a lot because of the wind and the rain and the bad weather so we're glad we made that choice. However, we did not feel it was big enough for three people, three adults, maybe two adults and a very small child. So keep that in mind. The rates they advertise on their website are uh, base rates in the dead of winter. If you want something in the high season in the summer, it's going to cost you a lot more. So I picked uh, a, a random week in July. And um, let's see how much the two-person one costs. We skipped all the insurance for now. 1000 95 euros so that comes out to about 172 dollars per day if you do the math okay let's check out the uh, larger one checking the price on the three-person van comes out to about 344 dollars per day so um, you know it's a lot more than what you might expect when you just look at the website. So here I've summarized the daily cost to rent a van in Iceland. If you go low end, pretty cheap, small van, don't spend much gas, light on the groceries, no activities, you can probably get it down to about 230, 250. However, for a nicer van, a little nicer experience, it's going to cost a little bit more up into the 500 to 550 dollars per day and that's not counting restaurants when you arrive at the airport you'll go through a border control where they check your passport then you're free to go then you'll go by the duty-free store buy your liquor i think there are some limits you might want to check that and then uh, basically you just walk out nobody checked us or anything what, after we left lying? the duty-free store with our luggage 
prices are about what you would expect to pay at a normal liquor store in the United States, not a discount liquor store. We took a taxi to town and stayed at a hotel for a couple nights. So you go out this door, and then outside that door are where the taxis are waiting. You just go out and pick one and make a deal. It costs us about $150 to get to Rechevik, and it's about a 45-minute drive. Picking up your van, there may be a bit of a wait. We had to wait about a half an hour to get some help. Um, they're very busy in the summertime. Anyway, be sure and take a good video of your van. Um, I'll explain the insurance later, but we just opted for the collision, which was included in the price. And they walked us through how to set up the stove and the water and that kind of thing. So total time was about an hour and a half from the time we arrived to when we drove off with our van. Then we headed over to the nearby grocery store and picked up some food and stuff to drink and headed out. I'm going to go over some other things that would be good to know before you pick up your van and for right after you pick up your van. If you do decide to use your credit card companies um, collision damage waiver, be sure and check to see if they cover a van which could be considered a recreational vehicle or it could be considered an expensive vehicle. My company would not cover either so um, be sure and check that before you come to Iceland if you're going to use your credit card to cover your CDW. We ended up getting the collision insurance that came with the van and we did not get any extra insurance. This is volcano ash or sand or wind protection. What you might want to check that we learned from experience, um, when we first started going, the cigarette lighter didn't work, and that's important to keep our phone charged for our navigation. And so uh, I figured it was a fuse. I drove to a gas station and bought a pack of fuses. And luckily they had a manual in the car, so I was able to look up the fuse panel and open it up and change the fuse, and it worked. So I'd say make sure they have an annual that's in English that you can read. Maybe have them show you where the fuse panel is. Another problem I had is uh, I didn't really know how to work the grease control. It was a little different, but what I've seen, maybe ask them before you take the van how to use the grease control. And you don't want to have to walk in your speed all the time. So you set it at 90 kilometers per hour, it's about 50 miles. 55 miles per hour. And, uh, if, oftentimes that's too fast. So uh, I want to slow it down, drive the anchor when there's a lot of hills that curve or sheep around. A lot of cameras post it and they will record your speed, get your license plate, and uh, charge the van at your rental car agency. So uh, if you're speeding, you might have. A little surprise when you get back because they will charge you. It can be super windy and actually too windy to drive your van. So they'll tell you that you don't want to go uh, where it's more than like 35 miles per hour. One day our van company sent us a text t warning us of high wind and telling us to stay put. There's a color-coded wind speed map that is online that is very helpful for determining if it's safe to go to your next destination. Uh, as far as it handled, uh, I took a while to get used to driving a van. Set up high, they're kind of top heavy. Can't go as fast as a regular car, but it did. It's a diesel. It did have plenty of power for going up steep mountain passes. The grades here are sometimes 10 percent, maybe a little bit more. And it also had a, a good transmission where we could downshift and go down as slowly as we needed to without burning up our brakes. Um, the inside was really enough for my wife and myself. Uh, some negatives, I felt like the, uh, the bench seats were difficult to get our clothes and our groceries out of. But it was reasonably comfortable once made into a bed when we added our own backpacking pads. Uh, the cruise control worked really well. 
uh, that does not take diesel. That was easy to find. Um, the tires aren't that good on it, so when we camped out in a grassy field, if it rained, sometimes it would get slippery, and one time we almost had to get pulled out. So it'd be nice if it had better tires on it. The grocery stores in Iceland, particularly in Reykjavik, had mostly everything you would find in the U.S. Snacky stuff. Um, they have a lot of frozen goods, um, frozen meat, frozen snacks. They have, usually have a refrigerator room where you can get um, various things like chicken and salmon and cheese and yogurt. Um, some vegetables, fruit, meat, pre-made pasta, that kind of thing. However, you won't find all of this as you get further away from the capital. I'll go over that a little bit later. Here's a look at some of the produce and fruit that you can get um, in the capital in most of the grocery stores. Pretty nice and, and not real expensive, probably more expensive than what you pay in the United States, but overall not too bad. This receipt for 19,500 kronas was for our first batch of groceries, and that's about $150. Here's a look at some beer we bought. Overall, that was about $50, so a lot more expensive than in the States. A quick walkthrough of a liquor store in Retrovic next to the grocery store. They have about everything you can find in the States. Um, however, it's about two or three times more expensive than what you would pay in the States. And definitely way more than you would pay at the duty-free store in the airport. But anyway, here you can look and see if you see anything that you like. You can buy these fuel bottles for your stove in almost any gas station. They cost about $3 each and lasted about six meals of cooking. Here's a picture and some video of a grocery store that was probably the most remote that we were. Uh, we are in Husavik, which is about halfway around the ring road. Um, you can see there's way less choice in meat and fish and that kind of thing. Um, way more durable goods. And the produce was um, okay, but not that great. Anyway, you can take a look at that. So camping in, in Iceland, um, you can only camp in designated campgrounds. Uh, in the past, you could camp wherever you wanted to, but they've outlawed that. So you must camp in a campground. And um, generally, they cost from you know, 1.5 thousand kronons to one kronon per person. So for Marsh and I, it's been about two kronons to three or four kronons, <clears throat> which is about 15 to uh, $30 a night. Almost all of them have uh, sinks to do the dishes, uh, pretty nice and clean toilets with lights and, and toilet paper, uh, soap. Um, most of them have showers uh, that you operate with coins. Uh, a lot of them have washing machines. And then all of them have some way to get water. Some have hoses, which make it easier for us. Like we don't have to take our container out. And sometimes you have to take the container out and fill it up in the sink. <laughs> yeah, the uh, sink in the van is, is good for washing off vegetables or washing your hands or whatever. But it's a little small for doing a bunch of dishes. So <clears throat> we uh, we bought a dish pan for five bucks at one of the stores and we just carry the dishes to one of the camp sinks and do the dishes there at night and most of them even have hot running water so we can get them really clean so how do you find a campsite uh, well our camper company um, gave us a map online that showed campsites that they like and uh, sometimes we drive by a campsite, like the night before we found one along a lake that was a state campground, which is really nice. 
And uh, last night we uh, put put in our Google Maps. We searched campgrounds near uh, Denton Floss, and we found this one. It just it's a beautiful national park campground, and it was it was really pretty cheap. It was only about fifteen dollars for both of us. <clears throat> And you self-register, and the ranger comes by in the morning and makes sure that you did it. You you self-register on your phone online, and uh, yeah, they have a couple of different buildings with the toilets. We happen to have one close by here, and uh, we'll wash our dishes and dump our trash and be on our way today. The van companies might try and sell you on a discount card or a package deal for campgrounds. For us, that doesn't work because it really limits you where you can go and where you need to go each day. Um, it was much better for us just to go wherever we wanted and then find a campground and it didn't have to be in any discount card ring or any place we had to go that met that criteria. Here's a look around at the campground we stayed in Selfoss. It was probably one of our least favorite because they put everybody right next to each other, which we don't really like, but a lot of people do. And the total cost was about um, four krona, which is almost $30 a, a night. Once you got further away from the capital, it was easier to find campgrounds with a little room to spread out. Most every campground has some Wi-Fi. You look at like a toilet area, not bad, not great sinks, public sinks, um, and if you wanted a shower you had to pay extra. We re they did do recycling, you put, dump your garbage, you could do your dishes on an outside sink, just drink the water right out of the faucets, it's as good a water as anywhere in the world. The showers at this campground cost about 70 cents for three minutes, so maybe a couple bucks for a nine minute shower is fine. We found this campground, it was part of the Icelandic National Park System, and it was uh, really remote, hardly anybody there, and, and pretty nice facilities. We really enjoyed the 66 North Campground. There was plenty of room to spread out. We had great views right on the ocean, the Greenland Sea, and we even did our wash up in their main house. Again, as you got further from... Rechevik, uh, and you were able to spread out a little bit more. This is near the Lake Mivatan area. Areas had little work rooms or places where you could eat in case you don't have any room in your van. As we went as we went around the West Fjords, we found more and more remote type campgrounds. Prices were about the same, but as you can see in this picture, we had it all to ourselves next to the water. It was super nice. Then this one's the Orange Sand Beach on the uh, south side of the fjords. Really pretty. It's called Melanie's Campground. It's part of the park system. The road is pretty steep and rough to get to this campground, so be sure you have a decent van that can make it, mainly the steepness of the road. Here's another little camp spot. We had wild ptarmigans running through our campground. And uh, it was on the West Fjords as well. So here's a little picture of the inside of the van. Table, bed big enough for two, not three. It was nice to have a place out of the rain in order to put on the rain gear and to get dried off. Okay, today I'm going to show you how to make the bed back into a table. the table, try and line it up, and rotate it on there, pound it. Okay, I'm going to show you around the camper a little bit. This is the cooler that came with it, and it holds, uh, you can see, not too much. The legs a little bit loose, 
So the thing about this cooler, it only uh, gets cold while you're driving. <clears throat> so if you have something like fish or chicken or whatever, I would recommend putting it on the bottom. The bottom's the coldest and then put some ice in a bag on top of that. And that way the ice will keep freezing and keep the thing cold. You can use it for rinsing off vegetables or doing dishes. And then you put it in with the notch up. And then lock it down, push this lock in, click, and it should be lighting. Okay, then in about oh, three or four minutes it starts boiling. These empty canisters you should throw away and a designated spot in the campground. Here's the water tank. To fill it up, you disconnect it and take the tank out and fill it up at a sink. Or for me, it's just easier to get a hose and fill it up with a hose. So here's all. Here's all the kitchen stuff that was included with our van. Our own cooler that we brought with us on the plane. <clears throat> and we keep our ice in there and maybe some stuff like lettuce, drinks, uh, bulky things like mushrooms. <clears throat> He supplied us with a few blankets like this, which we kind of use to cover the seeds when we're soaking wet, so that's handy. Under the seat, we keep our uh, liquor supply and our food. <clears throat> it's somewhat organized. On this side, we keep both of our sets of clothes. Okay, we're going to make the bed. Our van came with a heater, which is pretty cool, controlled by this knob here. And then it's got a separate battery and that tells you the voltage. And it, it actually it actually runs on the diesel from the uh, tank of the car, so we don't have to worry about fuel. And since it has a separate battery, we don't have to worry about it draining the car battery. And we brought our own sleeping bags and a little blow up pillow and a little backpacking pad. As far as renting chairs from the van company, we got these two large ones. My only complaint is that they take a lot of space underneath. So yeah, the chairs are large and comfortable, but so far this week we've rarely used them because it's so cold and raining outside that we generally in the evening just sit in the van. So I'd probably skip the chairs. You're probably going to need some kind of way to charge your devices, especially your phone at night. So at a minimum, I would recommend getting a power bank. You can charge this from the USB port in the front while you're driving then it will run your phone for a couple of nights. I bought one of these, this weighs about two pounds and it's uh, like, like a portable inverter. You can plug in AC or you can switch it to uh, DC and charge your phone or your uh, camera batteries or you can run your laptop or in my case, um, I run a CPAP at night on this. Um, we also, we have we have a cigarette lighter in the back. I charge it while we're driving. Generally, generally that's not quite enough to keep it charged up. So you can plug it in uh, with a, a AC adapter as well at the campgrounds if you can find an outlet. So anyway, um, between those those two things, the outlet that only runs when the car is running, <clears throat> 
you should be able to keep your devices charged and ready to go. We felt hiking poles were a must as there is a lot of steep, rough terrain and they really help us get around. A mount for your phone is really awesome. We have a free plan itinerary and we also have a paper map backup as well as our maps on Google. We tried to keep it easy cooking in the van. Uh, breakfast mostly consisted of granola, yogurt, milk, and berries. Sometimes we would cook um, eggs. Stir fry in one pan were great. Uh, an omelet in one pan is great. Sandwiches quickly. Uh, we pan fried salmon. We even made quite a few salads as produce was easy to come by. There's kind of a look at our table cooking. Sometimes we kept like the broccoli warm over the over something cooking on the lower pan. Every now and then we would eat out, get a beer, get a nice dinner or get an inexpensive dinner. Uh, generally, food was a little more expensive than you would get in the United States. Take those prices and multiply by seven. Anyway, um, it was nice to have somebody cook for us now and then. The first time I tried to get fuel in Iceland, I wasn't successful. It's a little bit trickier and it's definitely more expensive. But what you want to keep in mind is they do not take credit cards. They only take debit cards where you have to enter your PIN. Diesel in this country is not green, it's black. So be sure and put black if you're doing diesel. They have this thing called Ad Blue, but our guy said not to use that. In this case, we spent 12,000 kronons. That's around $84. We had to fill the tank about every four days, so that's around $20 per day. That's running the van about two to four hours a day. Our activities included boat ride in the lagoon, going to hot springs, the Vok Baths. As you can see, that cost about $50. Going horseback riding at Salt Vic, that was about $110 each. Going to museums, such as the Phytological Museum in Rechevik, the Sorcery Museum in the West Fjords. Also doing a little shopping for Icelandic wool items. One thing about power here, you'll need to buy a converter for European plugs. Okay, so what's the deal with drones in Iceland? There's a lot of places where you cannot fly them. Some notes about drone photography. First, when you're in a popular spot like this waterfall, they are prohibited, so don't fly them there. But if you're along a road or an insignificant spot, you can fly them. And you're supposed to um, put a sticker with your name and phone number on your drone. You're not supposed to fly it higher than 400 feet. And if you would want to fly it in one of these prohibited areas, you would have to get special permission. I didn't look into that as I figure it would probably be reserved for filmmakers or documentaries or something like that on the island. Well, on the north end right now, uh, just right near the Arctic Circle at a campground called 66 North. And uh, we have actually very good LTE cell phone service. So what are your options? Well, uh, for us, uh, we use Verizon, and Verizon offers a what's called a travel pass at ten dollars a day, and they give you half a gigabyte of data, and the flea includes talk and text as well. Uh, at our camper dealer, um, they offered a 
similar thing, a uh, cell phone to be a hot spot for $50 a day. Highways are pretty good in Iceland. Here's an example of the pretty good ones. But notice that they don't really have much shoulder, so it's really difficult to pull off um, in most cases. However, there are sections like this that are much better than others. Here's an example of the narrower roads, especially on the southeast side of Iceland. Almost all the bridges in Iceland are single lane, so you'll need to stop a ways before, see if anybody's coming, and if not, then proceed. They're safe enough, but you don't want to be hitting somebody on the bridge. Some of the roads are not paved at all. Make sure you have decent tires on your van. A lot of them go over one to 2,000 foot passes that are very steep and narrow. So make sure your vehicle's worthy and you're prepared for it. Here's a clip of the pass to the Melanie's campground. I don't know how to pronounce that place in Icelandic, but it was uh, pretty steep and a little bit scary. Some normal two-wheel drive smaller cars were having a little bit of trouble, but most everybody else was making it. Sheep everywhere next to the road in Iceland. If you hit one, you have to pay the farmer $500 and also the damage to the van, so be really careful. Sometimes the sheep run across and sometimes they go back the other way. There's a lot of tunnels in Iceland. They're really nice, but some are single lane, and a couple of them you have to pay a toll, so check with your van company to see if you'll have to pay a toll, and if you do, you need to get online with your phone and pay it, or they'll charge you double or triple when you get back to your van rental company. If there's a toll, you'll see a sign with a QR code and a way to pay from your phone. Well, we've reached the end of our journey, and I just want to say that we really enjoy camping by camper van. We were able to modify our itinerary as needed. We could eat the food we wanted. We could sleep in whatever campground we wanted. We could go on the hikes and the trips that we wanted to. And it was very personal and customizable. We hope you enjoyed the video. And if you did, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Thank you.